Our Gospel reading for this morning continues with the Sermon on the Mount, which we have followed for some time now. Um, In this particular passage, Jesus is continuing to explain what he meant when he said earlier that he is the fulfillment of the law, not the end of it, and that his followers are to have a righteousness exceeding that of the scribes and Pharisees. We heard a portion of the teachings related to that where he recalled uh, some of the Old Testament laws and then reinterpreted them, and we hear more of that in today's reading. Uh, Some of this is familiar to some of you. uh, In the portion where Jesus talks about going a second mile, uh, when commanded to go one mile, that probably refers to the ability of Roman authorities and soldiers to impress Uh, the local people into service and carry things for them a certain distance. Listen now for what the Spirit may speak to us through these words today. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, Do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and send rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. (coughs) Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What are some of the groups and organizations that you belong to? You don't have to say them, but think them. Um, I've never been a big joiner, but nonetheless, I've been a member in good standing with a number of groups and organizations over the years. Uh, I used to be a member of the AWSA, the American Water Ski Association. (laughs) I'm a member of the alumni organizations of two universities and one seminary. And the AARP keeps sending me invitations to join them, but I always throw those away. (laughs) What does it mean to be a member of some group, some organization? Why join the AARP or the Water Ski Association or the Chamber of Commerce or some club at school? Why are you a member of the groups you belong to? (coughs) Now, I suspect that the reasons vary widely. I had to join the AWSA in order to ski in tournaments. I didn't really get asked whether or not I wanted to be in those alumni organizations. And the AARP promises me discounts on all sorts of products and services as well as other benefits. Now, I'm not a member of the Smithsonian, although I've learned I could be for just $26. But nonetheless, I had the opportunity the other day to visit the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. You can't really take it all in in a single day, but it's a remarkable experience. 
The history part of the museum is designed to begin at the very bottom, way down below ground, moving through dark exhibits of slave ships and the early slave trade in the American colonies. And, and as you continue on, you move upward through the Civil War and Reconstruction and the rise of Jim Crow and segregation and the Civil Rights Movement, finally ending at the inauguration of our first African-American president. And I was going through the Civil Rights section looking at exhibits on the Montgomery bus boycott and the Freedom Riders and the March on Washington. And as I did, I noticed that the term member was hardly mentioned. It was true, there were organizations that one could join to support the Civil Rights Movement. There was the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the um, Congress on Racial Equality, or CORE, and you could join those and become a member. But, but the big moments in the Civil Rights Movement were not about membership. <coughs> they were about active engagement and participation. Now, I'm not sure how it was that the church came to use the term member to refer to participants in a local faith community. I mean, after all, we already had a perfectly good word, disciple. It's the word that's used of those original followers of Jesus. And it's the word Jesus uses when he commands them to start building the church. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. The job of the church, according to Jesus, is to make disciples, something that takes place through baptism and through obedience, through learning to obey all those commands that Jesus gives. And the Sermon on the Mount is the first big discipleship lesson that Jesus offers. Turn the other cheek. Give to everyone who begs from you. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, if you've been around church for very long, you've probably bumped into these commands at some point. But surely Jesus doesn't actually expect us to do them. When I was studying the, the passage for today, I came across a story about a New Testament scholar who was checking his voicemail and found this message from his 10-year-old daughter. Dad, I'm the lector at church Sunday, and I have that passage where Jesus says, turn the other cheek. You know that passage, right? Do the other gospels have the same passage? Is it different in the other gospels? Could you let me know, because, no offense, Dad, but I think Jesus is wrong. <laughs> now, 10-year-olds may feel it's okay to say that out loud, but most adult church folks wouldn't do it, even if we may think it. Fortunately for us, we have more subtle, sophisticated ways of getting around Jesus' commands, of explaining what he must have really meant so that we don't have to take him literally. But what if Jesus really does mean these commands to be taken literally? What if these are precisely those commands Jesus expects disciples to learn to obey? I think the problem with Jesus' commands may be less about how difficult, even impossible, they sound, 
and more about the way we hear them. By that I mean that we tend to hear Jesus' teachings the way we hear just about any other advice or instruction or teachings that we encounter. We weigh them based on how they impact us, on whether or not they will get us something that we want, make us feel better, or some other thing that we are seeking. But measured this way doesn't work. By such measures, as that 10-year-old says, Jesus is just wrong. In that space where there's always a quote on the front of the bulletin, it says, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus at his ornery best, offering advice <coughs> that makes no sense divorced from the nature of the one giving it. We imagine that we can evaluate what Jesus tells us the way we evaluate all the other information that we encounter, but it simply won't work. As the Apostle Paul writes to his congregation, the way of Jesus, the way of the cross, is foolishness according to human and worldly standards. Only when we began to get caught up into the transformative power of Christ in what the Bible speaks of as salvation do Jesus' commands start to sound life-giving. At the very end of our reading today, Jesus gives what is perhaps his most impossible sounding command to us. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Thanks, Jesus. Aren't we already under enough pressure to be productive, to perform? Doesn't our culture already do plenty to make us feel like we're not quite good enough. Jesus can be quite demanding. But I don't think that he says here what we may first think he does. This is another one of those places where something gets a little lost in translation. It's not that perfect is really a bad translation, it's simply an incomplete one. Some of you may be familiar with the philosophical term telos, which refers to something's final purpose or end. And telos is related to the word here translated perfect, a word that also means complete and mature. And Jesus is saying that we need to live into our purpose, to what we're meant to be. We need to fulfill our purpose. Jesus says that if we want to participate in the movement that he is beginning, a movement that reveals God's hope for future, then we must begin moving toward our God-created purpose toward becoming people who bear God's image into the world and reveal it to the world. And Jesus shows us what that looks like. Jesus lives it for us when he refuses to strike back at those who strike him, when he gives to everyone who comes and asks of him, when he prays on the cross for his own executioners. Jesus' words, his commands, are not figurative or spiritual. 
Jesus truly expects us to reject violence, to help whenever and wherever we can, to seek the good of all, including our worst enemies. <coughs> Jesus genuinely expects us to learn to relate to the world and those around us as God does with generosity, tender mercy, and steadfast love. But this is not one more to-do list heaped upon us who are already overwhelmed by the demands of the world. Rather, it is gracious invitation to an entirely new way of living, one that fits who we truly are in our deepest essence. This is invitation to the joyful, abundant life that begins when we choose to walk with Jesus as he reveals to us the true meaning of being fully and completely human, of being true children of God. All praise and glory to the God who comes among us as Jesus and calls us to new life. Thanks be to God.